Okay, and what will hopefully be the final installment of the video on how to model the DC motor in Simulink. We are ready to actually plug in numbers. Uh, if you, uh, re as you recall from the last video, these are the values that we've been given. These are again uh, essentially motor parameters except for IL, which is um, the uh, moment of inertia of our load. So uh, up here we're going to need the value of KT over IL. It turns out without actually saying what the units are that that's equal to 4. Um, okay, so and I just noticed I have no idea what I was thinking here. This is Newton meters. I don't know what the M is supposed to be there. Okay, so now we're ready to actually plug this stuff into the uh, Simulink model and uh, see how the whole thing works. So we bring up our Simulink model and uh, the uh, gain in the expression for omega uh, or in the integrator that gives us omega. Remember that's kt over il, which has a value of 4. Um, oh, we've got a mistake, which uh, is kind of sad. Um, I'm going to need to uh, eliminate this connection and add a gain term here because I forgot that I was uh, multiplying uh, everything that goes into here by 1 over L. In fact, actually that might be a better way to do it. Let's do that. So let's make this go away. We'll take these guys and hook it back up. We'll get rid of this. Uh, slide our adder over a little bit and add a gain. And this gain is going to be the 1 over L term. Okay, so now we'll connect this up. And we'll connect this up. And it looks like we've created a reasonable mess here. Okay, L is 0.2 Henry's, which means this gain, which is 1 over L, is going to be 1 over 0.2. It's one of the nice things about doing this uh, in MATLAB is I think you can actually set these gains up as expressions. Okay, so we've got a 1 over 0.2. The gain coming in here from omega is k sub b, and you'll recall that k sub b is 0.22 volts per radians per second. Uh, the gain on the current i is r, and uh, uh, amazingly enough I've chosen r to be 1 ohm so we don't have to change that gain. So I think we're ready to uh, simulate this and see if it all works out. So we start up the simulation. It runs for a while. We now look at omega. We now look at the current. And uh, this is reasonably bad. You'll notice uh, the way the step function is, uh, oops, the way the step function is implemented in LabVIEW, it uh, goes to 1 at time 1. So basically, um, I have uh, these two signals, i and omega, that are 0 until the step function goes up to 1, and then they just take off like crazy. And uh, that's not good. So does anybody see why it's working that way? Well, the answer is uh, that if I go back to my expression, I've got a uh, minus sign here and a minus sign here. But I didn't include those in the gains. So instead of having what amounts to a negative feedback situation, where things limit themselves after a while, I've got a positive feedback situation where things just blow up. So uh, for those of you 
that are wondering, this is actually an unstable system. I put in a nice step function that is bounded, and I get out these uh, this omega value that uh, takes off towards infinity. But I hope I can fix that by just changing the sign of this gain to be negative, to take into account that negative sign that I missed, and changing the sign of this gain to be negative. Okay, I think this is likely to work better now. But I guess we'll see. So we run the simulation. It runs for a minute. It beeps at us, which tells us that it's done. And oh, we get something that looks like this. Okay, so what you see is um, the current goes, when, when the step function of the voltage occurs, the current goes up because it's uh, applying torque to the load and uh, the load is starting to spin. And then the current goes down towards zero. We'll talk about that in just a minute. The angular velocity of the load starts to increase and it keeps increasing until it gets to some constant value which looks like it's a little bit lower than 5 uh, radians per second. Okay, so um, there you have it. We've actually successfully uh, simulated this system. Uh, just a few comments about why it does what it does before we're, we're done. Um, you'll notice that the load reaches some final velocity and just keeps spinning at that velocity. Uh, this turns out to be a property of DC motors, that they have a top speed. And the reason they have a top speed is that as the load starts to spin faster, um, the uh, feedback uh, in, that comes through the back EMF, uh, the back EMF gets larger, which means that the voltage applied across uh, the coil in the motor is actually getting smaller and smaller and you reach a steady state value where the voltage across the coil is essentially zero because the back EMF is large enough. And because the voltage across the coil is zero, that's why the current tends to zero. Now in real life it doesn't really work this way. In real life there's always some energy gained in keeping the load rotating. We haven't modeled that in this uh, example. Uh, we haven't modeled any friction on the load, which is the sort of thing that would uh, that you would need to model in order to include the effect of uh, keeping the load rotating. If you do that, then it would drop omega a little bit and the current wouldn't approach zero, it would approach some steady state value, which again is the current necessary to overcome the friction to keep the load rotating. Uh, but we didn't do it that way. Here we assumed a frictionless load, so at some point once you get the thing rotating, then um, it'll just spin forever and you don't have to add any extra energy. So, that was a fairly long example. Hopefully, the things that I'm hoping you came away from, there, uh, one is just the idea that um, most of the dynamical systems you model can be represented in terms of differential equations. And so, the goal in doing that is to get a couple of differential equations. Um, when you go to implement it in LabVIEW, you need to identify state variables. And in this case, the state variable is the angular velocity and the current. One way you can tell what state variables are is they're going to be the outputs of your integrators. Um, but the trick is often to figure out what should the outputs of the integrators be in order to make the whole thing work. But that's, that's how you can identify state variables. And uh, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to say about this. Uh, so we'll end this demonstration and you can uh, start building models of your own.